Uh, the first picture is uh, the John Dewey Emeritus Professor from Columbia University. Um, and uh, um, I think it's probably a bit of a mugs game to attempt to uh, summarize all of the areas in which Hitcher has made a, a, a contribution. So I'm not, I'm not going to try that, you know, all the way from philosophy of biology to lots of groundbreaking work in political philosophy, science, and social epistemology, um, all the way through to ethics and humanism and Finnegan's Wake um, and many, many other things. So I won't um, uh, try to, to do justice to that. Um, but we're, we're really delighted to have um, uh, Philip here to give this lecture, and um, I think I'll just pass over to you. Well, thank you, Adam, and thanks to you and Sabina and the whole committee for setting up this wonderful occasion. It's a splendid celebration, and thank you for inviting me. And now I want to go back a few decades. In the beginning, <laughs> there was philosophical darkness on the face of exile. And the Solons of the university said, let there be John Dupre. And lo, there was the genus and the philosophy department, and the Solons saw that it was good. <laughs> so what has happened here? Since this university courted Virginia Gagné, to be a worthy successor to the redoubtable Michael Wood in the English department. And then they wondered what they should do for or with the husband. <laughs> John and Virginia had been tenured professors in two outstanding departments at a major American university. And they left partly because of their dislike of the right-wing miasma that hangs over statements of Stanford, and partly because they wanted their boys, Gabe and Julian, to grow up in a different kind of environment. But John arrived here as a part-time professor attached to sociology, with another part-time job at Birkbeck in London. He was the only philosopher around. So the creation myth with which I began, like some other creation myths, is not exactly accurate. <laughs> nobody at this university foresaw what John might be able to do for it, but then nobody knew him. Now, I first met him 40 odd years ago. It was at a meeting of the American Philosophical Association. On that, we agree. <laughs> <laughs> but we disagree, though, about how it happened. In John's version, I went over to talk to him. In mine, he came over to talk to me. <laughs> so we both credit the other one in initiating our friendship. Now, some of John's personal qualities are known to everybody in this room. He's famous around the philosophy profession for his wit and his social sparkle. More importantly, he's much loved for the kindness that's second nature to him. He's helped numerous philosophers find their feet he has given himself to promote valuable ventures. Aegenius, for example, began as the lowliest of the funded centers set up to explore the social implications of genomics. It established itself as the principal British institution engaged in that project. Why? All because of John. I remember a conversation with Nick Rose when we were fellow members of the advisory board in the center's early days. We agreed that the board was utterly unnecessary. John knew exactly what to do, and we should just stand back and clap. <laughs> Yet, I want to add something that I find even more important about John. He has a true gift for friendship. And I think that's increasingly rare in a world where friending happens rather casually. He knows how to talk and how to listen, how to give and how to receive. He knows what real friendship is. So he's been not only a close philosophical interlocutor, as close as any of my philosophical interlocutors, but also a cherished friend. So it's a great honor and pleasure to talk about him today. Now it's time to stop embarrassing him. I'm gonna to turn to philosophy. John, as we know, is one of the most eminent philosophers of science in the world. Um, now, this will not advance as advertised, so I'll just thump, I'll thump a, um, an arrow, see what happens. Use the mouse, click on, click on the mouse on the screen. Yeah. There we go. That's the, all right. Okay. 
excellent. The disorder of things, we've heard a lot about it today, it's a classic. His books exposing the ways in which biology and economics buttress socially obnoxious conclusions <laughs> are, are rightly influential. <laughs> He's expanded our views of what biology is and how its central themes should be conceived. All these things are commonplace. Today, what I want to do is juxtapose two characters. I'll call them John Early and John Late. <laughs> At the time we first met, John had just published a brilliant article to which Katie referred earlier, uh, in which he introduced and defended what he called promiscuous realism, the thesis that nature is multiply jointed with real divisions that answer to different explorations. More recently, in his Gifford lectures, if you have his Gifford lectures, uh, he has let his metaphysical proclivities hang out, <laughs> as the Nixon gang would say, um, suggesting that we should think of processes as the fundamental entities in the world. Despite his enthusiasm for disorder, expressed in a fierce opposition to reductionism in the sciences, he wants a unified ontology, one based on processes. How does the early promiscuity fit with the later <laughs> monogamy? <laughs> now, over the four decades of our friendship, we seem to have moved in opposite directions. In the early 1980s, I was one of the founding members of the Unification Church, believing that scientific explanations unified the phenomenon. John was skeptical of such proposals, rightly. Since then, I've come to think the quest for a general theory of scientific explanation is misguided. I think scientific explanations are quite diverse. The pluralism I once espoused about species concepts and later about units of selection has been extended more widely. Meanwhile, John has campaigned for a unified ontology in which processes are fundamental. In his Gifford lectures, he makes a strong case for viewing some biological phenomena in terms of processes. He argues for the fruitfulness of regarding organisms and species as processes rather than as things. I agree that using processual descriptions to reconceptualize some biological issues brings certain features into higher relief, thus facilitating particular kinds of explanations, predictions, and interventions. But I have two questions about the metaphysical ambition to replace an ontology of things with an ontology of processes. The first and less important stems from a suspicion that without some reference to things, there will be no available points of reference from which to identify and individuate processes. The second is generated by my latter day promiscuous impulses. Should we assume that a single ontological picture will be well suited to all our purposes? Perhaps in the spirit of John Early, we might require different ways of characterizing the world as we move from project to project. Now, the remainder of this talk will mostly be devoted to pursuing the second issue. But first, I want to look, take a quick look at some points about individuation. Consider an uncontroversial instance of a process. At 10 a.m. one Saturday, John goes out to weed the garden. Two hours later, he takes a break for lunch. From 2 p.m. to 5 p.m., the weeding continues, after which he comes in for a drink and he checks on the test match. The process of John's weeding falls into two non-continuous segments. How do we identify it? Well, normally, we do it by starting with things. John, his garden, weeds, Morehouse, Virginia's specialty sandwiches, the garden again, more weeds. All of these could, of course, be conceived as processes. That would raise questions about how to identify them. One of these things seems especially relevant to our initial attempt at identifying the Saturday weeding. John. Process John starts when two other processes combine. He retains a special connection with one of them for a few months. After that, he is detached, his world line no longer continuous with either of the generating processes, although for a significant period, often in proximity to one or both of them. 
various properties distinguish process charm from lots of processes with geometrically similar world lines? Are there enough to differentiate process charm from all these other processes? The most promising way to address that question is, I think, to invoke a spatio-temporal framework. Pick an origin, the Big Bang will do. Set up, set up three spatial axes and one temporal axis. Then we can identify the Earth process as originating in a particular region of this four-dimensional structure, locate the Britain process, and finally, process John's point of origin. Once we have that, process John has been identified. This will solve the problem without invoking any material objects. They can all be regenerated as processes originating in particular space-time regions and thereafter grouped by shared common properties or by their historical connections with one another. But we still have to invoke some thingy entities, some fixtures in the Heraclitean flux. We need space-time points, an origin and axes. Now, I hope you have been impatient with this tangled metaphysics. I introduce it only as a stepping stone to a more important point. Lots of everyday talk about the world and investigations of it would be inconvenient to the point of unfe infeasibility if it had to be conducted by supposing that its processes all the way down. Our normal practices of conversation and inquiry individuate processes by appealing to things, for some purposes, it's valuable to treat some of these things as processes. For different purposes, it's valuable to view them as stable objects. John could conduct his weekend weeding by using a taxonomy supplied by botany. Glancing down at his lawn, he says, Ah, bloody Taraxacum officinale again, root it out. A few moments later, he smiles benignly to observe another member of the Asteraceae and leaves a fine specimen of Bellis perennis to grow. At the end of the day, he digs up an Allium sepa for dinner, allowing his Allium millennium to continue to flower. But actual John doesn't say any of those things. He counts the dandelion as a weed, the daisy and the lily as flowers, and the onion as a vegetable. Uh, you will notice that Katie also <laughs> went to the same example. Uh, uh, that makes his life far easier than having in his head a long list of Latin names of plants he's out to annihilate, a similarly long list of those he aims to cultivate, and a somewhat shorter list of those with which the family and the lucky guests will get fed. John Early saw this very clearly in that brilliant article to which I, I referred. Different vocabularies suit different human purposes. That was the core insight of his promiscuous realism. Why then insist on a single ontological category as suited to all talk and all inquiry? Why even suppose that a single vocabulary process talk suffices for all biological purposes? Are we witnessing the rate's progress? Has John Early become a fussy Puritan? <laughs> Rebutting this charge and achieving reconciliation proves res relatively easy. Instead of claiming that processes are ontologically fundamental and that the world consists of processes, John could offer a more modest thesis. Human beings have many different purposes, and to expedite all these purposes, different ways of dividing up reality are needed. No classificatory system is the equivalent of the ideal Swiss army knife. Processes are often a good idea, especially in parts of biology, but any division that is workable for some cluster of human purposes is natural. Hence, there are many overlapping systems of natural kinds. Gardeners, cooks, and biological systematists all pick out real divisions in nature. This is the position I think the author of Disorder of Things ought to adopt, although he might well want to refine my formulation of it. In the remainder of this talk, I want to contrast it with a slightly different view, one that retains the promiscuity but dilutes the realism. The motivation for this alternative view comes from suspicion aroused by one of the phrases I have employed. What exactly are real divisions in nature? Are there any such things? 
Let's move from the garden to the kitchen. <laughs> Julian has come home for a visit and prepares the family dinner. It's to be a vegetable extravaganza. He will use asparagus, artichokes, beets, beans, daikon, eggplant, fennel, and more. <laughs> no celery, though, since one of the diners is allergic to that. Despite the allergy, celery still counts as a vegetable. Why? Because most people can digest it. Some years pass. As a result of new techniques in preparing processed food consumed variously by children around the world, most people come to be allergic to celery. It is no longer sold in grocery stores and is scrapped from the canonical list of vegetables. There's compensation though. Potato roots and eggplant leaves are now digestible by a majority of human beings. Supermarkets advertise them as gourmet treats. Which of these classes of plants picks out a real division in nature? The old one? The new one? Both. A second example. Um, it's the normal mouse button. Sorry? The normal mouse button should work. Okay. No. Well, let me try that. Yeah, that's not a good one. I've done it. It's fine. Don't, don't worry. A second example. Britain is an island. Which chunk of the Earth's surface constituted? To answer the question, we need to fix the island's perimeter. But now John's promiscuity surges back. Is it the land exposed at the lowest tides, so that the sea invades a part of Britain every day? <laughs> or at the highest tide, allowing people to venture into what properly belongs to the sea and still remain dry. Or somewhere in between. These questions will be answered differently by different people, geologists, kayakers, hikers, and commissions concerning with, concerned with protecting against storm surges and floods. Different human purposes, different perimeters. Are they all real divisions in nature? For a third case, I'm going to return to a question John and I debated some 15 or so years ago. Are there human races? From the 1960s on, a significant number of thinkers, many of them anthropologists, recommended a negative answer. They hoped to eliminate racism by debunking the concept of race. A worthy aim, Although whether you can achieve it by undermining a concept strikes me as dubious. John, a firm elim eliminativist, was similarly worried. Now human history has surely been dominated by ugly conceptions of race. They have often supposed a hierarchy of races. They have usually marked some groups as essentially and inevitably inferior. It's sobering to read Jefferson's notes on the state of Virginia and to discover that a man enlightened in many respects could hold such repugnant views about a group of people, including one woman with whom he had sexual relations. Yet vile as these social and folk concepts of race undoubtedly have been, there is an alternative notion articulated by biology who have freed it from any essentialist or hierarchical assumptions. Contributors to the evolutionary synthesis of the 1930s most prominently Theodosius Dobzhansky, were interested in the internal structure of biological species and the existence of subgroups that might exhibit the beginnings of speciation, species in statu nascendi, as they called them. That tradition was continued by L. L. Cavalli Sforza and his younger colleague, Mark Feldman, at Stanford, who investigated the human population. Both were determinedly anti-racist, and Feldman, in particular, wrote brilliant articles about the flaws in alleged demonstrations of racial differences in socially significant properties. One of the major scientific articles published in this century is a paper by Feldman and his research team. Well, try again. Using genomic data on the frequency of genetically meaningless sequences among various human populations, Feldman and co. identified various clusters within Homo sapiens, 
they were thus able to answer a sequence of questions. If you divided our species into two on the basis of genetic similarity, where would the partition come? Suppose you made the division threefold, where, what would it be? And so on, for any number you care to choose. Here are the answers for the first few questions. Two divisions, you get America on one hand and Africa, including Eurasia on the other. Three divisions, America, Africa, and Eurasia. Four divisions, East Asia is hived off. Five, separate out Oceania. The first surprise comes at six. The small population in Pakistan is differentiated. Feldman and his colleagues were cautious, punctilious in referring to the subgroups as clusters. They hypothesized in ways motivated by the biological species concept that the divisions represented the history of human migrations and the relative strength of the barriers to mating between groups of people. Almost immediately, though, journalists imposed a different language. Writing in the New York Times, Nicholas Way advertised the article as identifying human races. Since then, a considerable amount of sophisticated philosophical work has been done to articulate a non-racialist approach to human races, building on the science I've sketched. Apparently, dividing our species into something like races is useful for demographic research. With appropriate circumspection, this concept can be deployed without any of the hideous assumptions about racial differences that have been done so much damage in the past. Nevertheless, whether or not the word race is used to denote the clusters, it is entirely reasonable to wonder that circumspection will lapse, that old associations will leak in, and that the groundbreaking scientific work will be distorted to support socially destructive conclusions. We're dealing with a concept that straddles two domains, science and society. Should we ban it, despite its demographic utility, as eliminativists would urge? Or should it be retained, surrounded with some precautions for avoiding its social abuse? These are ethical questions, and different people offer different answers. Tommy Shelby, for, for instance, has argued for retaining the concept of race on the grounds that it is useful for generating a form of solidarity that will help undo the harms of past racialism. Now, I draw two morals from this example. First, off-the-cuff answers are premature. Serious ethical inquiry is required, and that can only be and only proceed by inclusive deliberation, well informed and committed to engaging with all perspectives. Second, the constructive or creative aspect of human boundary drawing shows up very clearly in this example. If there are races, how many are there? Feldman's work seems to answer that with another question: How many do you want? <laughs> the three examples I've offered could be read as re revelations of the promiscuity John Early celebrated. Promiscuous realism revels in an unexpectedly vast number of natural divisions in reality. Yet many of these divisions seem to arise from human needs, human desires, and to be properly settled by ethical explorations. Are we tracing the independent structure of the world or drawing boundaries to suit ourselves? Is the trail of the human serpent over everything? William James thought so. The idea of the organization of the world as humanly constructed is not only articulated in his pragmatism lectures, to which I just alluded, but present already in a great work, his Principles of Psychology. Towards the close of the stream of thought chapter of that seminal work, James raises a pertinent philosophical question. But what are things? Nothing, as we shall abundantly see, but special groups of sensible qualities which happen practically or aesthetically to interest us, to which we therefore give substantive names, and which we exalt to this exclusive status of independence and dignity. But in itself, apart from my interest, 
A particular dust wreath on a windy day is just as much of an individual thing and just as much or as little deserves an individual name as my own body does. Set on one side, the misleading restriction to sensible qualities and the attributions of independence and dignity. The core of James's position is that ontological decisions depend on us and vary with our interests. The point is developed later in the same chapter by using a suggestive but difficult analogy. The mind, in short, works on the data it receives very much as a sculptor works on a block of stone. In a sense, the statue stood there from eternity, but there were a thousand different ones beside it, and the sculptor alone is to thank for having extricated this one from the rest. The world we feel and live in will be that which our ancestors and we, by slowly cumulative strokes of choice, have extricated out of this like sculptors, by simply rejecting certain portions of the given stuff. Other sculptors, other statues from the same stone, other minds, other worlds from the same monotonous and inexpressive chaos. My world is but one in a million alike embedded, alike real to those who may abstract them. How different must be the worlds in the consciousness of ant, cuttlefish, or crab? The final sentence draws on physiological understandings. Recognizing the differences in sensory faculties, the diversity of organismic needs, and the variety and capacities for satisfying those needs, James suggests that different animals must organize their experience in radically different ways. If non-human animals were to speak to us, their ways of identifying objects and properties would diverge so much from ours that, just as Wittgenstein would later predict, we would not understand them. James's remarks about the cumulative work of our ancestors, however, deny that biological differences are the sole source for variation in world making. Cultural changes modify human predilections, forcing reorganization. They thus change the world, or at least the world we feel and live in. James's analogy is, I think, seductive. A promiscuous realist, early John, however, is likely to counsel resisting its charms. Is James arguing that we are completely free in organizing our world of experience? I'll henceforth call it the Lebensville. The thought of making up the Lebensville, however we like, is belied by our experience. Sometimes the world is a stern Papirian resisting our efforts to impose a particular kind of organization on it. Realists must amend the analogy. The block of stone can't be treated as homogeneous, allowing for the liberation of any internal chunk to stand forth as a separate statue once the surrounding material has fallen away. If the sculptor tries to turn the chisel down some, indeed most lines, it will slide, moving along neighboring fault lines in the stone. These fault lines represent the structure within the stone. They determine the natural divisions in reality. They allow a large variety of statues to be built. Many of these correspond to Lebensvelt human beings could never live in for the worlds of non-human animals, crabs, cuttlefish, and the like. Others represent the many worlds, worlds inhabitable by human beings who will never develop the interests to make them appropriate. Human beings are not the authors or sculptors of the Lebensvelt in which they live. They have selected one Lebensvelt from the many, attending to one portion of the structure of reality. Promiscuous realists, thus recognized lots of deep divisions in nature. Animals, including human beings, latch on to some of these to generate the Lebensvelt manifested in their actions. Moreover, as human culture evolves, our species reconstructs the Lebensvelt. We organize the world differently. We might even say something like the following. At the very least, as a result of discovering oxygen, Lavoisier saw nature different. And in the absence of some recourse to that hypothetical fixed nature that he saw differently, the principle of economy will urge us to say that after discovering oxygen, 
Lavoisier lived in a different world. Those sentences come from the 10th chapter, the notorious X-rated section <laughs> of the structure of scientific revolutions. A section, interestingly, in which Kuhn appeals both to William James and Nelson Goodman, whose later book, Ways of World Making, will recapitulate some of its themes and provoke similar cries of outrage. But what exactly is this principle of economy to which Kuhn appeals? I reconstruct his thinking as follows. Our language refers to the constituents of an organized world, our Lebenswelt, about which we can pose sensibly questions about the relations among those constituents, about which, if any, are most fundamental, about how many there are, and so forth. Those questions presuppose prior decisions, possibly taken quite unconsciously at the direction of our biological impulses about how to answer the questions. What is a thing? Moreover, in reflecting on language and its relation to the world, we are already presupposing the same scheme of organization. All our discourse is about the Lebensfeld. As Kuhn sees it, the further thought of a relation between language and the underlying structure of the world is an irrelevant extra. It tries to say the impossible, to allege a fit between the organized world and reality. But the phrase, phrases we use can only be metaphors and analogies, picturing reality in the only language we have, the language of the Lebensfeld. We project characteristics we recognize in the Lebensfeld onto something beyond it, conceiving the world, capital letters, as a multi-jointed beast, that's Plato's version, or a block of marble with fault lines. The right strategy, Kuhn thinks, is to give up the attempt. Inquiry generally is an attempt to find ways of organizing our experience, selecting those that work to advance our projects, rejecting the many in which we experience resistance. Or more exactly, with the racial example in mind, we try to find divisions and forms of organization that help in those projects endorsed by ethical inquiry. The structure of the Lebensfeld emerges from the interplay then between factual and ethical investigations. Now, resistance is all too familiar. What James and Kuhn recommend is avoiding trying to provide a deep metaphysical explanation of the source of resistance. We can say with John Late that thinking in terms of things rather than processes gets in the way of our efforts to understand certain facets of evolution. That's fine. What we should not say is that particular divisions into biological species, say, or into processes correspond to the deep structure of the world. <clears throat> Whereas others don't and that the mismatch between some categories and the deep structure is the underlying cause of the resistance we feel. Causal talk relates elements of the Lebensfeld. It doesn't fathom the relation between the Lebensfeld and some incoherently hypothesized source of resistance. This is, I think, a deep theme in pragmatism. It reflects James's interpretation of Percy's principle. We ought to abandon questions that lead that lack implications for human conduct. It's present in his apparently astonishing suggestion that truth happens to an idea. It's further developed in Dewey's equally surprising claim that human beings reconstruct the world. Kuhn and Goodman, the latter already in the structure of appearance and fact, fiction, and forecast, are heirs to this tradition. As I'm sure many of you already appreciate, the tradition doesn't begin with the classical pragmatists. We'll come to that. First, however, it's worth seeing how the concerns I've raised arise with a special severity when realism goes promiscuous. Here's another way to present John Early's great insight. Nature doesn't set an agenda for the investigators. It isn't divided into units ready to call out to us, come over here, look at me, I'm important. The questions we pose arise from our diverse needs and our diverse interests. Hence, gardeners and cooks require categories different from those deployed by botanists and evolutionary theorists. According to George Washington Carver, he was on the screen earlier, a weed is a flower growing in the wrong place. 
Similarly, a vegetable is a non-flowering part of a plant human beings can digest. Tastes in flowers change. The human digestive system can be affected by diet or by other environmental causes. It's easy to envisage Julian having a different array of vegetables for some future extravaganza, Shay John, or John coming to direct his weeding activities towards a different collection of plants. John Early can make sense of these changes by supposing that both categories represent real divisions in nature. There are lots of structures, lots of fault lines from which people select the ones that are valuable for their purposes. At different times, the selections may go differently. Similarly, reality allows many perimeters for Britain. Swimmers, hikers, kayakers, geologists, flood engineers can be permitted their different ways of drawing it, all pick out objective boundaries in the natural world. But how far can this go? Is any continuous curve within the space between the high tide and the low tide perimeters sanctioned as natural? Surely there are only a few such curves that are suited to actual human practices. Again, though, that could change. The kayaking boundary might shift with modifications of technology, enabling kayaks to come closer or the, the best kayaks uh, to have to go further out. Or more fancifully, the boundary might be drawn to suit some new type of activity involving with contact with water or land at what would now appear a bizarre sequence of places, an activity that comes to dominate the coastal scene. Imagine lots of people playing this game around the coast of Britain. Moreover, the boundaries of Britain are easily contracted or expanded. Parts of the land are ground down, uh, or there are new structures extended as far as you like. France, Iceland, North American shores. Does paint and pier already count as part of Britain? <laughs> Naturally. <laughs> the emerging concern is the possibility of conceiving any boundary as natural, whether it's used to demarcate the contours of an object, to mark the world line of a process, or to group objects <laughs> into some category. At first sight, some hypothetical objects appear absurd. Consider the chunk of space-time made up from Queen Victoria's left big toe, the manuscript of Finnegan's Wake, and the largest and most stubborn root among all the dandelions in John's garden. <laughs> Can we conceive of a human pursuit facilitated by thinking of that as a single object? My treatment of the perimeter of Britain points the way. If we can imagine a coastal activity pursued by a trajectory tracing out any arbitrarily assigned curve, we can also imagine a practice, a religion, say, <laughs> uh, that identifies what we would view as three independent objects as aspects of a sacred trinity. <laughs> it looks, then, as if anything goes. To accommodate the full range of potential human pursuits, we must allow any boundary whatsoever to count as a natural division in nature. Promiscuous realism becomes California naturalism. Whatever. <laughs> the distinction between selecting from the large menu reality presents and constructing the categories that work seems to evaporate. Pragmatists will see no difference in conduct and will suggest abandoning talk of natural divisions. How could John limit the process of expansion in which more and more boundaries are certified as natural? By restricting the human purposes to those espoused now? But why should this particular moment in our history be privileged? My third racial case offers a more promising suggestion. Don't allow any purpose to be approved. Just focus on those that could be validated by ethical inquiry. If you accept the ethical permissibility of the Feldman notions of clusters or race, that would allow natural divisions to appear for a sequence of choices how many races do you want? It would debar, however, those proceeding by appeal to a number of properties traditionally associated with racial division. But I don't think John would want to pursue this option for its ability to block alternative ways of demarcation that would generate the same overabundance of natural categories by deploying physical properties as criteria of demarcation rather than ethically obnoxious ones is far from clear. 
Moreover, even if it were successful, it would tip promiscuous realism in an odd direction. The natural divisions of reality would reflect a subset of potential human interest, those according with the result of properly conducted ethical inquiries. In effect, the natural divisions of reality would represent the ethical structure of the world. John Lake should, I think, give up the Nixonian hangout route of heavy duty metaphysics. He should become a promiscuous or perhaps more decorously pluralist pragmatist. Let me briefly sketch how this would go. Human inquiry is motivated by the practical need to solve all kinds of problems, although in the course of our history, certain questions are generated and sort of out of our natural curiosity. The questions we pose already embody ways of organizing our experience, but as we proceed, we discover improvements in how we frame things. Those improvements better serve our purposes. Moreover, the purposes themselves evolve. Sometimes that occurs as the result of processes modifying our views about what is ethically correct. A genius pursues the implications of genomics without lapsing into discredited forms of eugenics. The primary function of the concepts of truth, accuracy, and correctness is, I suggest, to mark judgments and other representative vehicles like graphs and, and diagrams and maps and so forth as suitable for use in further practice. This is something you can rely on in your investigations. It is perfectly reasonable to think of truth as relating some judgments to objects and properties in the Lebenswelt via the familiar task and machinery. Inquiry generally is driven by our attempts to say what is true or better true enough to advance our purposes within the language we currently speak and also to amend that language to make our efforts to pursue our aims go more easily and more successfully. Remember my parody of John with the Latin taxonomy in the garden. Since we have plenty of different legitimate purposes, we often need many different ways of dividing up the same domain of experience. The complete Lebenswelt contains many world versions among which we move without any strain. People of a metaphysical bent are easily led to ask extra questions when they think about conceptual change and conceptual pluralism. They start from a commonplace observation. Sometimes, as we discover, the language we've been using doesn't work very well. We encounter resistance. If you have a metaphysical itch, you want to know why this happens. There are perfectly straightforward answers to specific why questions like this, given by scientists and historians of science. We can account for the failures of the language of chemistry used before Lavoisier, or for the difficulties of bi biological taxonomy before we, didn't, before we knew about evolution. The language of the Lebensfeld suffices for understanding the difficulties of prior versions of the Lebensfeld. Metaphysical itches survive, however. What the metaphysician wants is a general account of the source of resistance. Thus arise stories about divisions in nature and analogies about fault lines in blocks of marble. When those stories are pursued further, even a stalwart anti-reductionist like John may be seduced into talking about fundamental ontology. Earlier, I heard resistance to our efforts in a Popperian voice, and it's useful to extend that analogy. The metaphysical debate with which I've been concerned centers on the limits of human freedom in organizing the Lebensfeld. Which bits come from us and which are dictated by something beyond us? Within the Lebensfeld, we can separate the creative artist from the faithful reporter. If resistance were not a Popperian voice, if the voice came with three responses, no, yes, yeah, you can do that if you want, that's okay. Um, we could differentiate the places in which we overstepped or conformed to nature's own boundaries from those in which we could draw lines of our own choosing. Unfortunately for the metaphysician, resistance has only two modes. It's either present or absent. But it's no great loss, for we can manage without an answer to the general question of how free we are. We can simply get on with the business of inquiry. Pragmatists will see an alleged difference that makes no difference. Why then 
isn't drawing late, a pluralist pragmatist. Kevin Jack, he views the philosophical approach I've outlined as having a disreputable pedigree. He does not want to go over to the dark side. James and Dewey were profoundly influenced by Ralph Waldo Emerson, hailed in his time as America's greatest thinker. Today, most philosophers would exclude Emerson from the canon. His writings are epigrammatic, loose, couched in the idiom of the pulpit rather than of the philosophy seminar. Moreover, he seems to make wild and outrageous suggestions, like the last sentence of Nature, his first book, and according to some critics, his best book. Build, therefore, your own world. Now, look, this is a pretty sober lot of people. I think it needs some color and some festivity. So, <laughs> that's what I want. But that's the way I wanted to go forward, but now I want to take it back. Behind Emerson stands the murky tradition of post-Kantian idealism, a poison injected into the bloodstream of American thought by a British <laughs> drug addict, a British drug addict, a poet like Emerson, known in his own time as something of a philosopher. <laughs> there he is. This poet, especially enamored of the writings of Schelling, made friends in the early 1790s with a fellow poet whom he later credited with having written the first philosophic poem in the English language. I think he's right about that, actually. In that friendship, I hope, lies the key to winning John's heart for pluralist pragmatism. For the poet who received praise for his philosophic efforts gives the best general statement of the position I know, and does so in poems that John and I both admire. <laughs> He writes, for example, lines like these. Therefore am I still a lover of the meadows and the woods and mountains, and of all that we behold from this green earth, of all the mighty world of eye and ear, both what they half create and what perceive, well pleased to recognize in nature and the language of the sense the anchor of my purest thoughts, the nurse, the guide, the guardian of my heart and soul of all my moral being. This passage, in the early poem prompted by his return to Tinton Abbey, is only the beginning of many others that collectively illuminate the kind of pragmatist pluralism I've been trying to motivate. I hope our shared love of Wordsworth will help bring John over to the dark side. <laughs> but even if, as Wordsworth sees, we often can't tell what we perceive from what we half create, there are some clear cases. <laughs> There can be no doubt at all about John's creative success, both in his impact on philosophy and his institution building at Exeter. So let us clap together and applaud him. 